I want to show you how important it is for all of us to protect the most sensitive and beautiful parts of our planet. From Greenland to Antarctica, from coral reefs to rainforests, even if we believe they have nothing to do with our jobs, our businesses, and our daily lives. I also want to learn, together with you, the solutions to the climate crisis that are available to all of us in different countries and regions. My name is Pancho Campo, and my personal crusade is to show you, through the Planet Future documentaries, the impacts that climate change is having around the world. Because we cannot wait any longer. The time to act is now. We are driving from Reykjavik to the little town of Vik i Myrdal in the south part of Iceland. That will be our base camp for the expedition we have planned with Josh, who will be our glacier guide. Josh will take us to Solheimajökull, it's the name of the glacier, where he will explain us how the climate change is impacting glaciers not only in Iceland but around the world. And uh, also we're going to fly the drone, we're going to learn what are crevasses and different aspects of glaciarology or however you want to say that. So let's go to this uh, little town called Vik in Myrdal. Um, it's at the base of the glacier, but also very near from the Goldna volcano. The south coast of Iceland is an astonishing medley of waterfalls, glaciers and famous black sand beaches, home to the biggest glacier in Europe and gateway to some of the most beautiful hiking areas in Iceland. The village of Vik i Myrdal is the southernmost village in Iceland, located on the main ring road around the island, approximately 180 kilometers by road southeast of Reykjavik. Despite its small size, with only 750 inhabitants, it is the largest settlement for some 70 kilometers around and is a key staging post. It is an important service center for the inhabitants and visitors to the coastal strip between Skogar and the west edge of the Myrdal Sandur Glacier Outwash Plain. Planet Future brings us today to Solheima Jokul. It's a glacier and it's a leg of a much bigger glacier called Myrdals Jokul. I am going to meet with Josh, who will be my guide for today, and he's passionate about glaciers. I will be asking him a lot of questions about the importance of glaciers, how climate change is impacting this part of the world. And I am fully equipped. I got my crampons, I got my harness, which I hope I don't need to use because it's only for emergencies. And I got my uh, ice axe. Uh, but before we go and meet Josh, I'm going to show you this. This is a lake that is frozen now. I came with my family about four or five years ago. And in the summer, it's a beautiful lake where you can do some kayaking around the icebergs. And then you can witness very close from, you know, from a very short angle, the glacier right behind me. Sol Heima Yoko. Let's go and meet Josh. We are standing here just at the front of Sol Heima Yokut. And about five years ago, when I first started my job here, this was the old access to the glacier. So we'd be walking on the ice now, heading all the way up to the top there. And I get this question asked to me a lot as well. Why is the ice blue? Why is it the color that we have just up here? Well, the main reason for this is um, when light enters the glacial ice, only blue light has the energy to escape and this is what hits you in the eyes. The ice itself is very, very dense, and this is why the majority of all the other colors of light are absorbed, and only blue light is able to escape, and this is why we see the ice is blue. Glaciers are massive bodies of slowly moving ice. Glaciers form on land, and they are made up of fallen snow that gets compressed into ice over many centuries. They move slowly downward due to gravity. Most glaciers today are remnants of the massive ice sheets that cover Earth during the Ice Age. The last Ice Age ended more than 10,000 years ago. The 269 glaciers are the hallmark of Iceland, and their contrasting nature with volcanoes is the reason why Iceland is known as the land of ice and fire. Today, Iceland glaciers cover 10% of the area, 
but due to the climate crisis and therefore the melting, they are constantly retreating. The different speeds at which the glacier moves causes tension to build within the brittle or upper part of the ice. The top of the glacier can fracture, forming cracks known as crevasses. These crevasses can be very dangerous for mountaineers. They can open quickly and be very deep. Moulins are another formation that carve into glaciers. A moulin is a deep, nearly vertical pipeline in the glacier formed by meltwater on top of the glacier falling through a crack in the ice. Moulins are often much deeper than crevasses, going all the way to the bottom of the glacier. Glaciers are important indicators of global warming, as well as climate change in several ways. Scientists who study glaciers are known as glaciologists. And glaciologists began studying glaciers during the 19th century to look for clues about past ice ages. Nowadays, glaciologists study glaciers to find clues about the warming of the planet. Melting ice sheets contribute to rising sea levels. As ice sheets in Antarctica, the Arctic, Greenland, and glaciers melt, they raise the level of the ocean. Icelandic mountain guides organized our glacier hiking excursions, and my guide was George Purcello, a very knowledgeable Australian expert glaciologist. We visited two different glaciers, Solheima Jokut and Europe's largest glacier, the massive Vadna Jokut. A solid, they uh, function a lot like a liquid would, so they will flow into an area and they sort of spread out, and the spreading out cracks the ice apart and forms uh, crevasses here, and then there, and then there, and you normally find a whole bunch of them together, stretching for quite some distance up and around on these glaciers. Crevasses are very dangerous, they are quite deep, which is why we carry a lot of rescue equipment with us. We have very, very long ropes to uh, yeah, drop down and pull anyone else that falls down there. Planet Future brings you today to one of the most beautiful waterfalls anywhere in the world and one of the largest in Iceland. 25 meters wide, 60 meters tall, and its water gives origin to this river next to me, uh, named after the Kararak River Skagafoss. This waterfall has been the location of many movies, for example, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, played by Ben Stiller, but also Marvel's Thor. But why don't you come with me and let's get a much closer look of Skagafoss. Let's go. Over 70% of Iceland's electricity comes from hydropower, with the remaining 30% produced from geothermal power. The primary source of hydropower is the meltwater rivers flowing off massive glaciers. Icelanders have over 100 years of experience in designing, building and maintaining large-scale hydropower stations and power transmission systems. Iceland's mountainous landscape combined with northern latitude, which has lots of rain, snow and glaciers, is why the country has so many waterfalls and cascading water slopes. Based on current estimates, it is considered that there are over 10,000 waterfalls in Iceland. Some are larger than others, and some plummet into small blue pools, while others dribble over mass-covered rocks or lava fields. Hydroelectric power is produced from moving water. Because the source of hydroelectric power is water, hydroelectric power plants are usually located on or near a water source. The volume of the water flow and the change in elevation from one point to another determine the amount of available energy in moving water. I'm sure you guys will remember that a few years ago there was the eruption of an Icelandic volcano with a very complicated name, Eja Falla Jokul or something like that. That volcano, its smoke and its eruption disrupted all the air traffic in Europe. And the reason why I mentioned this is because the water melted from that volcano gives origin to this fantastic waterfall called 
Celia Lanfos. Reykjavik might very well be the smallest big city in the world. It's a vibrant little capital city and the place from where usually everything starts in Iceland, such as excursions, activities, whale watching trips, northern lights chasing, and lots more. This hassle free city is very safe, clean, and packed with restaurants, shopping, culture, and a great nightlife. I have been to Reykjavik three times since 2015, and it has been its dining options increased dramatically in the past few years. From fine dining to coffee shops, plenty of vegan and organic options, as well as an excellent variety of locally brewed beers. And according to President Bill Clinton, arguably the best hot dog in the world. Reka Vodka! Reka is a premium vodka distilled in Iceland using renewable energy and it takes advantage of the country's pristine natural resources. It was the first to be distilled and bottled in the country and features an emission-free distillery that relies on the area's geothermal energy. Reika is without a doubt the best vodka I have ever tried and one of the smoothest you can taste. At their factory in Borgarnes, I met Thordur Sigurdsson, the master distiller who is also the local fireman and policeman. Uh, vodka here in Iceland, uh, the key factor in, in why we are making it here in Iceland is because we have really clean air, we are far away from early industrial pollution, we have an endless amount of high quality water and of, uh, the, of course we are using geothermal energy to, to run the still and, and we buy our electricity from, from re renewable power plants. So now we are running, each distillation is in three parts head, center and the tail. We call the head, we call that the four shot. That is the first liter to come from each distillation. And the center, that is just a Reka spirit. That's the only thing we are using for bottling. And we are at the Reka section at the moment, or spirit section at the moment. And when the alcohol strength start to fall, we cut into the tail or the faints. Four shot and the faint, that's just metal from the whiskey industry. But we are obviously not, not, not making any whiskey here, we are making vodka. And you know, it's quite a unique process. We are using Carter head still for, for distilling this vodka. And you know, that is, means that we are only use, distilling one batch at a time. We are not on constant running still. That means that we, you know, make a decision of how big the batch should be 1,800 liters, and we distill that, and then the process is. Landburn is the Icelandic Environment Association and a national non-government organization. In recent years, Landburn has also expanded to become a leading NGO in environmental education in Iceland, mainly focusing on children and teenagers, but also on adults. Landburn is the largest service provider in the field of environmental education in Iceland. In recent years, the association has focused on climate change and the impact of the ever-increasing number of tourists visiting the delicate nature of Iceland. Augusta Jones Dottir is a board member at Landburn, who is also working on a very interesting environmental project for her PhD. Yeah, my PhD is about uh, the circular economy and business models, actually. It's just to look at the present, uh, current uh, uh, situation in Iceland in two different industries. I'm looking at uh, the building industry and also the fisheries industry and to look for opportunities and to just to to, to uh, research the dynamics that are happening there and to see if there are opportunities for um, sustainable, we, we call it maybe sometimes a business case for sustainability. This is where you can both earn money <laughs> and decrease the impact. On or increase the, the circularity of your company. What we do is that we educate people, especially children. We work in schools and educate people, and then we uh, promote nature. We kind of feel nature is our best friend that doesn't have a voice. So we are trying to be the voice of that nature. We have already lost our first glacier, which is Orkid, which was uh, disappeared about uh, two or three years ago. And the glacier that we see from Reykjavik, for example, Snæfellsjökull, 
we expect this uh, glacier to last maybe 20 or 30 more years, and then it, it is disappearing. So this is, and the, the glaciers are both uh, melting, they are both uh, decreasing and uh, thin, they are also thinner every year. But also we have uh, extreme weather events. And um, we have, because the permafrost is uh, going down, we have landslides, just the whole mountains even, just moving down. We've had this uh, once this year and also last year. And we have so many avalanches during the winter because of the instability, because it's snowing and uh, yeah. What we're facing now is mostly the industry is demanding for more power plants being built. So there is a demand for more green energy and this uh, takes the environment. I mean, it destroys the nature that we have because the, it's demand for both uh, wind uh, energy and for hydro energy. And this is taking a lot of uh, nature away. And then we also have um, salmon being uh, artificial, uh, being um, in, in our seas. So, and this is a, a huge pressure. On the on the on the sea uh, environment, and also we don't really know what will happen with the with the ocean itself, with the pH and with the with the temperature of, of the ocean uh, changing, and this might impact our uh, our uh, fishing industries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Iceland we are lucky that already 30 or 40 years ago we transitioned all housing heating of the houses was was transformed into um, energy coming from the earth, from the hot water in the earth. So this is already uh, transitioned and this we use for all heating of all our uh, apartments, all our houses in Iceland. And we also produce a lot of energy uh, for all our electricity. We produce it already in hydro and we don't have any solar power, but we have only the transition that we have to go through in, in the future is uh, all fossil fuels which are more or less uh, used for the transportation industry. So it is for uh, airplanes, ships, and, um, and, uh, and cars. So, so this is the only thing that we need to transition in the future. And there is a demand from the industries, not only to transition this, what we are already producing, but increase industries. Because today, 80% of the of the energy that we actually produce goes to four aluminium smelters in Iceland, only four companies. So the decisions that we have, if we need to uh, create more power plants or not, is really dependent on also what, what's going to happen to those four facilities. If one of them shuts down, for example, we have plenty of spare energy. And therefore we have uh, created this simulator for decision making. So dependent on what happens in the future, to see how much energy you need. May, I mean, we, there are like a hundred of uh, different uh, ways to go in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are uh, multiple uh, ways. And uh, we can test what happens if with, with this simulator. So you can te test different uh, decisions. And uh, we can, for example, see what happens if one of the smelters closes down, what happens if they turn their business models to a uh, circularity, mm -hmm. so because this, uh, recycling uh, aluminium takes uh, 10 times less energy than uh, pr producing it from raw materials. And so we are very much dependent on what happens to those four smelters. And um, that's why we created this uh, simulator. The Aurora Borealis takes its name from the Roman goddess of dawn, Aurora, and the Greek word for the north wind, Boreas. From September to April, Iceland is a hotspot for this magnificent light show. The Aurora Borealis, more commonly referred to as the Northern Lights, is a natural phenomenon created when solar wind particles interact with the Earth's magnetic field. This excites the particles that release energy, causing peculiar luminous green and purple streaks across the skies. When chasing the northern lights, there are a few points to consider. You can go with an organized tour or on your own, which will be cheaper and perhaps more flexible. Make sure you check the Aurora forecast before heading out. There are a few websites that help you decide when and where you are most likely to see the auroras. 
head out of towns and cities to avoid light pollution. Make sure you wrap up warm and be prepared to wait. And try some well-known hotspots for watching the Northern Lights or Aurora Borealis. The Icelandic horses are as local to this volcanic land as its people. The very first members of the breed arrived aboard the Viking ships of Norse settlers sometime between 860 and 935 AD. Since then, selective breeding has made the Icelandic horse what it is today. Consequently, it is one of the purest horse breeds in the world. Icelandic law prevents horses from being imported into the country and exported animals are not allowed to return. Since 1982, East Hester has been the leading equine tourism company in Iceland and the Ice Hester's Riding Academy is Iceland's largest riding school. The horse center is in the outskirts of Reykjavik, just 15 minutes drive from the city center. At this horse riding center, we were hosted by Erla and Margaret, who taught us about the Icelandic horses, guided us through the stables, and took my daughter to a very exciting riding excursion. This is uh, mainly a horse riding farm. Um, we run uh, day tours for beginners and families. Uh, and then we do have multi-day tours for experienced riders and a riding school for young children here in Iceland. Well, the first settlers, they basically brought here with them all their best horses. And many of them came from Norway and even some all the way from Mongolia. And uh, then over the years, these horse breeds, they all kind of like mixed together. And then natural selection has uh, shaped the horse breed into what they are today. So uh, they are basically very well adapted to the nature and climate here, very really well adapted to Iceland. They are friendly <laughs> and very curious. Some can be a little bit stubborn and just each one has like their own special character. So every rider should be able to find the horse that they like here. They have been isolated here in the, on the island for the past 1000 years. And uh, that makes the Icelandic horse one of the purest horse breeds in the world. Uh, the animal welfare is of course very important for us because a happy horse makes for a happy rider. Mm -hmm. So our horses here, they all get like a minimum of four months off every year on pasture where they just get to roam around and be horses. And while they are here, we closely monitor their, uh, their work schedule. <laughs> <laughs> So every horse here gets a minimum of uh, gets a minimum one weekly day off while they are here. We also have a veterinarian on site that monitors their health, and we own over 140 horses. So we have 65 horses at home right now, and the rest of them are on holiday right now. Icelandic glacier water is considered as one of the best and purest mineral waters in the world. It is sourced from the legendary Olfus Spring in Iceland one of the world's most pristine ecosystems and it possesses a naturally low mineral content. It is filtered slowly for 5,000 years through layers of lava rock. Icelandic glacier water possesses a highly desirable and uncommonly high pH of 8.4, making it naturally alkaline. Icelandic Glacier has worked with the Carbon Neutral Company, a leading carbon emissions consultant, since 2007 and has been certified carbon neutral for both product and operation, an unprecedented move in the beverage industry. I visited their bottling plant, which is a sustainable operation fueled entirely by geothermal and hydroelectric power. This state-of-the-art facility is one of the world's greenest and cleanest. I also met with John Olafsson, the very charismatic and nice chairman and founder of the company. John is an entrepreneur who began his career in music and films and built Iceland's biggest media corporation, the Northern Lights Communications. Uh, my son was working on, on uh, a deal with some Saudis and they wanted to get into the water business and asked him to look for a source and a company. He found a small white labeling company in the area where we are today. It was in bankruptcy and he put in a bet, a bet for, 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 for the, the the bankroll company, and he won the bet. And uh, he called the Saudis and said, hey, you got a water company. But the Saudis never paid, so we were stuck with it. 
So three months later, I had sold all my other businesses in Iceland that I had been building for the last uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, I had no purpose in life. I was waking up every morning without going playing golf or out going to, to another work or going to school or something like that. So I called him, I asked him about the water company, what's happening with that? And uh, on, I was on the plane the next day and we decided to do it ourselves. So it was not planned, but it kind of ended up being what it is today. Well, our water is one of the best, if not the best water in the world. It is uh, very low in minerals, thanks to the island we live on. This is the youngest island on the planet. It's about five times younger than the Alps. So the rocks here that the water has to filter through is mainly lava. So it's very light in all minerals. We have a very low uh, number, which is about 62. And our pH level is higher than normal. We're between 8.4 to 9, but we put 8.4 on the bottle. So this is probably one of the best quality you can have in a good water. And Iceland, of course, is one of the greenest countries, if not the most green country in the world. And coming from here is really important because people see this as a clean, a nice country. The air is fresh. So everything here is very fresh. When you drink water, uh, water out of our bottle, you're drinking like straight from the, from, from, from the lake. We make sure that the water when it comes into the factory, it comes into a factory which was built as a pharmaceutical factory. So it's over-pressurized, there's no chance of any scent, dust or anything else to come into the factory. So it's completely clean and in the chamber where we put the water on bottles, that's over-pressurized many, many times over. So no negative air will, will come into the wind, in what I call negative air, the air we breathe da daily out here that air will not come to the bottle until you open it. So you, if this bottle is unopened for 10 years, it's going to taste exactly the same. What we do, we don't want to do any damage to, to the world uh, when it comes to uh, uh, carbon footprints. We, of course, import product, we export product, we fly and we drive, so we are creating carbon, carbon footprint. What we do, we have a company in, in England that's as, as called Carbon Neutral Corporation, and they, they audit our books and everything, the damage we do, we reinvest in, in renewable energy products to offset what we do. So we are the first company that was certified both for operation and, pro and, and production in the world. And we're very proud of that. And that's really helped us a lot going forward because see that we are really a green, true green company, a sustainable company, and we think about the environment and we do take care of it as much as possible. HS Orca has been a leader in the production of renewable energy for 45 years, servicing homes and businesses all around Iceland. Built around HS Orca's geothermal power plants, the resource park is a leading cluster for green and sustainable businesses. The resource park is built around Svartsengi geothermal power plant, Iceland's first combined heat and power plant. Various companies and partners have developed their businesses within or next to the resource park, most famously the Blue Lagoon Spa and Hotel, but also companies such as CRI International, the first large-scale green methanol producer in the world. We were received by Dagny jones Dotter, manager at the resource park. HS Orca is uh, mainly a geothermal power company. Uh, we uh, operate uh, two geothermal power plants here in uh, the Reykjanes Peninsula in Iceland. But uh, we also have uh, one uh, small run of a river hydro plant. So our main focus is uh, actually selling power. But uh, from geothermal uh, operations, you have a lot of additional resources from the, from the geothermal power. And that are resources that we sell along with the power. The resource park is a cluster of businesses that have like organically in the past formed around uh, HS Orca's geothermal power plants. So uh, for example, like all the geothermal streams that come from the ground when you're harnessing geothermal energy, uh, such as uh, you have power, you have hot water, you have cold water, uh, CO2, geothermal brine, 
and uh, warm seawater for uh, ocean cold, uh, ocean cooled plant. All of these are resources that can be utilized. And um, in the past, uh, the, the businesses organically formed around the geothermal uh, power plants because they wanted to utilize these resources along with the power. And that is what we call uh, the resource park. It's in two locations, one here in Svartsengi and another in Reykjanes uh, by the geothermal power plant there. And probably the most famous company in the research park is the Blue Lagoon, which was actually uh, an accident that happened uh, when we started geo uh, like harnessing geothermal power here in Sorsenge. Then uh, we didn't have the environmental regulations as we do today. So uh, we didn't have the injection method of injecting the geothermal liquid back into the ground and it just uh, flew uh, like it was a flow on the lava and it formed a blue lagoon and some crazy people started bathing in it and saw some uh, great uh, benefits for their skin and we realized these minerals in the blue lagoon were actually really good for all sorts of skin diseases. And uh, now the company has grown and is much bigger than us and receives 1.3 million visitors per year and has a spa and um, R&D center, hotels, and uh, they are now much more famous than we are. <laughs> what better way to finish our trip to Iceland than visiting the Blue Lagoon? The Blue Lagoon is a geothermal spa and hotel in Grindavik, southwestern Iceland, located between Keflavik Airport and the capital city of Reykjavik. It was named one of the 25 wonders of the world by National Geographic in 2012. The Blue Lagoon's waters and minerals are now known worldwide for its healing, rejuvenating and nourishing qualities. Its unique geothermal water is naturally renewed every 40 hours, has temperatures averaging between 37 and 40 degrees Celsius all year round, is a mixture of 30% fresh water and 70% seawater. It is enriched with silicon, algae and minerals, which are good for the skin. The complex boasts a skin treatment clinic, a spa, two fantastic hotels, several restaurants and bars, as well as a luxury changing room and showers. At the in-water mass bar, you can also benefit from the silica properties, which cleanses and strengthens your skin, giving you a fresh, pure and radiant appearance. The Blue Lagoon Algae Mask renews, nourishes and moisturizes your skin. This is a must visit place not only in Iceland, but anywhere in the world. The Blue Lagoon. Always when we are thinking about designing a new product or, or, or designing a new uh, experience here uh, in, in, in Svartsenki, uh, we are always looking at the resources. We're, so we're always thinking how can we use those resources more efficiently uh, and make more value out of it before we return it back, return it back to nature. So uh, I think we will probably continue in, on that journey. Uh, also to promote uh, s uh, sustainable tourism within Iceland as well. That is something that we're already looking into. And uh, uh, so we will continue on that path. But looking forward, you will always have to look uh, uh, where you begin in the, uh, in the first place. So uh, Grimer often says that, he, the CEO of the company, he says he started the company to help people. And that is why our mission is well-being for people and planet. So that is always our guiding light in everything we do. We always want to make ensure that uh, we are uh, producing products, we are designing experiences that are sustainable for the future. I have visited Iceland in three occasions since 2015, and it has become one of my favorite places to visit anywhere in the world. The landscapes are magnificent and totally different if you visit the country in the winter or in the summer. If you are like me, someone that loves active holidays, adventures and excursions, very few countries can offer such varied number of activities, from diving in Silfra to glacier hiking, 
or going on excursions, riding on a snowmobile, a horse, or a quad. The food scene has become one of the main attractions of Reykjavik. One can taste the traditional Viking and Icelandic specialties, but the current trend is the fusion between tradition and modern cuisine. However, the predominant feature is the use of local products, especially the amazing Icelandic cod, Arctic char, seafood, and arguably the best lamb in the world. Icelandic people, although regarded as cold and perhaps distant, always showed to us a great sense of hospitality and were very friendly. But focusing on the topic of the Planet Future documentaries and our foundation, it is evident that protecting the environment is at the top of Icelandic organizations, businesses, government and its population. Perhaps because the climate crisis is having a noticeable impact, especially accelerating the melting of glaciers, but also because Icelandic people have realized that their fragile but beautiful ecosystems need to be looked after. Many other countries should take example from Iceland, especially when it comes to the use of renewable energy such as geothermal and hydropower. I strongly recommend all our viewers to put Iceland very high up in their list of places to visit.